Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Career Nub Chats. We have with us Kriti Saxena, who is an associate at JP Morgan in Mumbai. She's going to talk about how to make big into the investment banking and how can you navigate through the career within an investment banking world. So welcome Kriti and thank you so much again for your time. Yeah, sure. Um, so as Utsav mentioned, uh, I am currently working as an associate in JP Morgan. I'm part of the debt capital markets team currently. Before that, I did my MBA from XLRI Jamshedpur, where I uh, specialized in finance. Uh, prior to MBA, I did my graduation from Netaji Subhash Institute of Technology. I was I was by degree an engineer, which was followed by two years stint in in a separate team in JP Morgan itself. And uh, during this time, I also appeared for uh, my CFA exam uh, because I felt like that would be uh, very pertinent to the career trajectory that I was taking. So that's all about me. Could you tell our viewers a bit more about the different career opportunities within the finance world? Sure. So um, actually, the finance domain is extremely, extremely varied. There are so many paths that you can take within the finance domain, and they're all very different from each other. So one is, of course, investment banking that we'll be going into detail uh, a little bit later. But there are a number of things like credit and equity research. So um, all of the broker reports that you probably would have seen or would have heard about maybe a buy rating or a sell rating that a specific broker house or a research house has given to a particular stock or a particular debt instrument by a particular company. These are the so-called public side uh, researchers who work on particular companies. Risk management uh, typically looks at what are the kind of assets that a particular bank is taking on its own balance sheet. And in order to ensure that the risk that they're taking is not disproportionately higher than the returns that they're expected to receive. Asset management, as we all might be aware, asset management is all about portfolio management and just ensuring that the overall portfolio of an individual or a company or an organization is aligned with the principles that a particular entity or person might have or in terms of the outlook that they have for the funds that they want to invest into the markets. Treasury, again, is something that is an internal uh, company vertical, which takes care of what the company does with its spare cash. Obviously, as an organization, you can't just leave your money lying around in, in FDs like we sometimes tend to do. So this is the team that takes care of uh, all the money decisions and how it should be wisely and uh, optimally uh, invested. Sales and trading, these are two teams which are uh, very much aligned with the public markets. They're again on the public side of uh, the operations, where the trading team is actually the one placing the orders, making the markets, and uh, fulfilling the orders of various clients. And the sales team is sort of the interface between the client and the trading team. Economic research is obviously also very critical to uh, finance because a large part of the trading and a large part of the investment banking divisions are very much impacted by the broader financial markets. So it is very critical to be aware of the trends and the various patterns that one can see once they are able to analyze a particular uh, trend over a period of time or maybe across industries. Then uh, quantitative analysis becomes uh, quite technical. They, uh, they take, instead of a fundamental approach, they take a more quantitative approach to analyzing the business and in order to, again, identify trends that they can probably use for their own uh, benefit and probably uh, automate trading and, and similar such activities. Private equity and venture capital have, of course, become very, very popular in recent times, given the complete boom that is going on currently in the Indian market markets uh, and startups. So these are the entities that um, so-called take a much higher risk and take bets on relatively new ideas. Even though they're very high risk, the expectation is, of course, of a proportionately high return that by nature of these businesses is what private equity and venture capital are about. Uh, the only difference between private equity and venture capital is the stage at which investors enter a particular business. Venture capital is when the business is a little more nascent. Private equity comes in once the startup business uh, matures a little bit. 
and has a little more traction. Corporate finance is more focused on, in general, if you are part of a company, how is the budgeting happening? Uh, what is the kind of uh, expenditure that is going, where it is going? What are the kind of capital structure decisions that need to be taken? And uh, how do you accept or reject a particular project? And will it add to the, the net worth of the company? All of these kind of decisions are taken by the corporate finance team. Then, of course, fintech is something that is fast evolving and emerging as a key area of uh, employment opportunities and uh, we have all heard of homegrown names like Paytm and Buildesk and so many others that are blooming right now. So this is also a great place to be in and very dynamic as well. Retail banking is the more traditional kind of banking like the HDFCs and the Axis banks of the world, um, which, um, which cater to people like you and I and and also to uh, corporates as well as to HNIs, depending on which part of the bank a particular entity or a particular person is dealing with. Then uh, accounts auditing is something that you would be more familiar with in terms of what a CA does. Basically, you, you go through the, the accounts of a particular company and you need to ensure that these are legitimate and these have been prepared in line with the accounting policies that have been set out as per the Indian general accounting policies or whatever standard is being followed in whichever country you're operating in. And financial planning and uh, analysis can be thought of as a subset of uh, corporate finance, but also it has a strategy angle to it where you need to ensure that the decisions that are being taken are also being used to further the growth and the, and the presence of a particular company in their domain. Great. Thank you so much for walking us through all the different career paths within the finance world. Let's zoom in into the investment banking world. So could you give us a brief overview of what exactly does investment banking mean? Sure. So investment banking at its core is an advisory service where we are trying to advise the clients on various aspects of the financial decisions that they take as part of their uh, usual business, be it something like a merger and acquisition. This is probably the most often heard term when it comes to investment banking, that m &A, uh, activity, be it the recent acquisition of HDFC, going through with uh, acquiring Exide and uh, other similar activities that are happening in the market, this probably makes the largest headlines. So people are fairly familiar with mergers and acquisitions. Then there is capital structure advisories. So you have a well-functioning company, but is your capital structure in the sense, what is the amount of equity that is there on your balance sheet? What is the amount of debt that you, that you have? And what kind of mix would be the optimum amount for the stage that you are in, for the industry that you are in, for um, the kind of uh, growth that you are targeting in the future. That brings us to the next part of uh, investment banking, which involves actually raising the required amount of debt or the required amount of equity uh, that a company requires. Of course, there are multiple routes to do that as well, but uh, debt capital markets and equity capital markets teams are the ones that uh, deal with this part of the entire investment banking process. A smaller part of debt capital markets is also ratings advisory, basically securing ratings from uh, rating agencies at India level. These are uh, these are entities like Crisil, ICRA, CARE. At an international level, these are entities like S&P Global, Moody's Financial Services, Fitch Ratings. And these are the well-known ones that uh, are well accepted by the investor base. And of course, there are uh, smaller assignments like fairness opinions where you go out and you talk about whether the valuation that has been given by a particular party, you are acting just as a third party, ensuring and giving your credentials to the number that has been proposed by another entity. In all of these things, in most of these uh, transactions, clients can vary from being companies to governments to supranational entities. Investment banks typically do not engage at the retail level or at an individual level. This is more of an entity-based relationship. Thanks for giving us a quick overview of the different verticals within the investment banking world. Could you help us explain the entire ecosystem of the investment banking world? Sure. So there are, of course, globally known players like the Goldman Sachs, uh, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Barclays, HSBCs of the world, which are the so-called bulge bracket banks, which has been a terminology that has existed on Wall Street for quite a while now. Probably that comes from the fact that these are one of the biggest financial institutions in the world. 
of course most of these banks have other verticals as well but in terms of investment banking these are the banks that um, have the strongest relationships with most of the largest clients globally when we focus more on india all of these banks have uh, a presence in india and of course there are local players as well kotak and axis have a flourishing ib practice there are other investment banks like avendus and jm financial and ambit who are also doing some phenomenal work uh, in the indian space just to switch gears a bit if somebody is in college or in their early stage career what are the different educational trajectories or the paths that one can take to become an investment banker sure so i'll uh, i'll break it down into two parts one is if you're pursuing your education in india and the second is if you're pursuing your education overseas so if you're a student in india and if you've done your engineering or a bcom or degree from one of the more reputed colleges from india there is a well charted out path where you can join the internal investment banking divisions of various banks that we just spoke about and uh, in that case uh, you will probably join as a junior analyst or an analyst depending on whatever is the trajectory that a particular company follows it's an entry level job but it's a great in into the investment banking world because as an engineering or a bcom graduate you haven't really learned much about finance especially as an engineering graduate as i was when i joined so these places are fantastic places to learn and to create and work on becoming the the kind of person that becomes a good investment banker if you are an mba graduate from an iim abc it's a well charted out path again because uh, most of the banks on the street would of course be wanting to to recruit the the right candidate from these colleges if you are an mba graduate from other indian b schools uh, apart from andabad bangalore and calcutta again uh, i think you will you will probably find yourself more suited or more eligible for the internal banking teams of various banks uh, but you will obviously be taken at a level higher than somebody who is just a graduate cas also uh, would probably find a similar path into investment banking where you can join the middle office or the internal investment banking division where you also join one step above the entry level position next if you are pursuing or if you are thinking of pursuing education overseas it's actually more flexible for for graduates who worked overseas to find their way into investment banking from personal experience i have uh, seen a lot of people across disciplines be it uh, something as focused on finance as a graduation in in an allied field or something as disconnected as a science focused uh, program it does not matter what your bachelor's degree is because there is a higher focus on the kind of soft skill that you have your ability to converse with other people and just your general marketability as a person that is i think the key for people who are trying to get into investment banking after completing the uh, graduation overseas if uh you've done your mba your post graduation uh, overseas then of course uh, especially if you have a uh, relevant work ex it becomes very easy to find a similar role in investment banking of course it is not impossible to make a, a domain switch but having relevant work ex helps roles for ms people who are uh, engaged in ms finance degrees they more focused on quantitative uh, roles rather than investment banking uh, because these courses are more suited for a more technical sort of role that the quant domain presents now uh, a very common question that comes up when we talk about investment banking is how important is the cfa exam how important is the frm exam what what is the merit or the demerits of uh, going for ncfm or any of the other certifications that are available and definitely there are pl- plenty so for cfa and frm personally i i feel like uh, these should be a greater focus if you want to gain the breadth of knowledge because obviously at least in cfa the scope of the syllabus is so broad that you will be able to understand the basic concepts of every domain in finance very well it will give you a very good starting point frm is of course more focused on credit risk management so if you are intending to join that kind of a role frm is quite pertinent but cfa presents to any person who doesn't really have prior work ex or any kind of in so called into investment banking it provides a good foot in the door 
Of course, it's an expensive uh, exam to take, even if, even if you're considering taking just one. Taking the CFA exam shows that you've taken the time and the effort to immerse yourself into the concepts of finance and it gives you a good into the investment banking world. As, as somebody who does not have any other uh, relevant work ex or internships to point towards. But apart from that, the focus should be to gain more knowledge when you're giving these kind of exams. Could you speak a bit about what exactly are the core skills which are required to become an investment banker? Sure. So, I mean, goes without saying, you do need a fair bit of financial knowledge. Of course, the level of your financial knowledge will depend on what your prior work is, if any is what your qualifications are. So if you're a fresher, if you're an engineering fresher, while you are expected to know a little bit of the basics, you will not be expected to make a three statement model right out of engineering college. Probably somebody who has done BCom would also not be expected to do a running three statement model, but they would probably be expected to know a little bit more about accounting and, and general financial concepts. If you've done your MBA, and especially if you are taking the off campus or the lateral route towards coming into investment banking, there is a very good likelihood that you will be expected to know valuations and the general corporate finance concepts that generally should should be known to somebody who's who's paid even a little bit of attention during the course of their MBA finance courses. Apart from that, you should really aim to have a general awareness of recent developments in financial markets, be it market transactions or economic trends that are impacting the, the markets. It's very, very critical that you remain abreast with these developments because it's always good to be able to have a conversation. At the end of the day, an interview is 20 minutes of a conversation that you need to fill with things that you're confident about. So if general awareness is something that you feel uh, you are strong with, uh, why not just fill that time to the extent possible and to the extent that it makes sense with, with this kind of uh, a conversation. And of course, having a well-informed conversation always sets you up in a more favorable position. Once you actually get the job, the basic to intermediate level of expertise in Microsoft PowerPoint and Microsoft Excel really helps you because your hours would be quite taxing. So the more comfortable you are with these tools and you will be spending 80 to 90% of your day with these two tools. So the more proficient you are with these tools, the more comfortable you are, the small shortcuts that shave off a few seconds every time you use them, rather than using your mouse and looking for how to get small things done. Over the course of the day, the week, the month, these things count and it's, it ends up saving you a lot of time and you become a more efficient person. Attention to de detail is extremely important because you are the person who is essentially responsible for putting together all of the pitch material that will eventually hit the client. So you, as part of a very lean team, will be individually responsible for the collateral that is going out to clients directly and that senior bankers would be using to sell a particular idea, sell a particular company to the client. So if there are any issues in the data or any discrepancies across various pages, it becomes problematic to focus on the right things in such conversations. Then a major important skill that is required is interpersonal skills. Interpersonal skills, with that, I mean two particular things. One is, of course, the communication skills. You need to be very comfortable talking to people and you need to be very confident when you present yourself to anybody. The second part is stakeholder management. You as part of, as I mentioned earlier, you will very likely be part of a small team. So you will be the face of the team to internal teams which are working alongside you on a particular transaction. You will also very often be required to interact with clients and other banks that are working on a particular transaction. So you need to ensure that you are well versed, not just with, with your concepts, but also you are able to ensure that you are communicating the right message to the right people at the right time. Then moving on to the next point that I feel is extremely important if you want to be successful as an investment banker is that you need to have the ability to grasp new concepts very quickly. It is such a fast paced environment that as much as people would want to hold your hand through various concepts and various procedures, they will not really have the time. So you will need to learn on the job and you will need to learn quickly. Because time is of the essence, there are always going to be more things on your plate than you will have time to complete in a particular day. One more thing is the ability to multitask. You will very likely be 
staffed on multiple projects at the same time. So it is essential for you to be able to switch contexts effectively between various transactions that are going on in parallel to be able to ensure that you are focusing on the right things in a particular transaction and not mixing things up across transactions. Lastly, but definitely a very important thing is, I'm sure you've uh, all heard this before, but investment banking is not everybody's cup of tea. And even if it is, some people just don't want that kind of life. So you need tenacity. You need to be able to work hard and you need to have the ability to perform in high pressure situations. If you are not able to, or you don't want to, investment banking is not the profession for you. If somebody actually gets a foot in the door and gets an interview, how does one prepare for an investment banking interview? Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, since m and is a more glamorized and a more publicized part of investment banking, most people think that investment banking means mergers and acquisitions, which is not always the case. So you need to have, for right off the bat, you need to have a very clear understanding of the role that you are interviewing for. If it is a mergers and acquisitions role, it might just be for a specific sector. So in that case, you need to be well aware of what sector you're you're walking into, what are the current trends, which are the main companies, what is the recent uh, activity that has been going on in this space. If it's a product role like an equity capital markets or a debt capital markets, you need to be aware of any recent transactions that have happened in, in India or abroad that were marquee deals for any particular reason. You need to be aware of uh, recent trends that have happened, say, for example, in debt capital markets. ESG bonds are taking the world by storm. Things like that only come once you are aware of what role you're you're applying for. And uh, I think the easiest way to understand the role is to go ahead and connect with somebody who is already part of this team and who's already been working in that particular domain. So as to get to know what a day in the life of a person who is part of that team looks like. Then one thing I feel that is very obvious, but still often gets ignored is that in all the rush of brushing up on your valuations and high, really high level concepts, one forgets to brush up the basics. And very often that's where you get stumped. So I would suggest that um, no matter how confident you are, I, I would highly recommend brushing up your finance basics and giving them at least as much, if not more importance, as the high level uh, concepts that you focus on typically when you go for these interviews. And of course, as I mentioned before, you need to be well aware of the current market situation. So reading the newspaper religiously becomes imperative. Next, and very often this happens, is that um, you submitted a particular CV and you don't really look at it till the interview is actually happening. And then the interview interviewer goes ahead and asks you a particular point to uh, something that is on your CV. And for some reason, you, you don't really have that story prepared. So I think I would recommend that one reviews their own CV thoroughly and get their story straight. If you're a fresher, definitely prepare a few of the standard behavioral questions because you as as somebody who does not have very pertinent work ex or internships or maybe even the right so-called right degree it is important to be seen as a culture fit because that is something that is very critical to banks especially investment banking teams because you're going to be spending a lot of time and a lot of stressful situations with your team, with the broader investment banking division. So the bank needs to know that you are a right fit in terms of your personality and how you would probably gel as a team member. Last but not the least, I would say that no matter how well you prepare, like any other interview, there is going to be something or the other that you are not prepared for or you are unable to answer. So that is obviously not the end of the world. And this is more of a general advice that you need to just hold your nerve and stay confident because at the end of the day, you as an investment banker need to be marketable. And even when you're presenting to clients, there would be situations where you might not be able to directly answer a question at that very moment when, when you are asked that question. So you need to not lose your cool. You need to ensure that you reassure the client that while you don't have the answer right away, you will find it and you will come back to them. And that is something that will really go a long way in an investment banking interview. In terms of uh, resources that you can use to prepare for an interview, of course, depending on what is the level that you're starting at, if you're a complete newbie, you can start with Investopedia, which sort of helps you build your financial vocabulary. CFA, as we already discussed, is a good way to build your concepts across the board. If you have a particular role or a team that you're focusing on, maybe you can just pick up the relevant, relevant module from the CFA course and go through it. Uh, then there are 
a plethora of uh, resources online, both free and paid. Things like breaking into Wall Street, Wall Sky to Investment Banking, Corporate Finance Institute. There are enough and more valuation courses and YouTube tutorials to help you sail through these exams in terms of learning the concepts. Can you give us a good <laughs> understanding of the typical investment banking team and how do you interact with different teams and how do you work? Sure. So tying in from what we discussed, investment banking typically does, there are three broad verticals within the investment banking division. One is mergers and acquisitions, obviously. Within the M&A umbrella, there are sector-focused teams, be it a tech team or an infrastructure team. All of these teams, depending on the client, say if I'm working with a consumer company, then I will probably head to the consumer-focused team and uh, ensure that they are the ones engaged on, on that particular transaction because they have the sector-specific knowledge. Similarly, for other, other sectors, say, for example, if I'm working with a bank, then I would in, try and ensure that the financial institutions team is focusing on that particular transaction. For product teams, the equity and the debt capital markets, these are sector agnostic. So in at any time, if a company wants to issue a debt instrument, they would go to the debt capital markets, but uh, there would be no buy further bifurcation in terms of sector focus. Similarly, if, if a company wants to go ahead and do an IPO, they can head over to the equity capital markets team. Obviously, there are a, a number of other kinds of transactions that equity and debt capital markets team also take up. So uh, this is basically how an investment banking team is laid out. Of course, we interact with a lot of other teams during the course of any particular transaction. There is a risk management team. There is the legal syndicate team. There is the sales and trading team, credit equity research, as we talked about earlier, and the corporate banking team. So all of these teams also have a very critical part to play over the transaction lifecycle. And uh, we have to liaise with all of them in order to ensure that a transaction completes successfully. Let's now talk more about your team and your role in particular. And if you can help us understand more about what exactly is debt capital markets and just give us a brief overview of what are the different kinds of things that you end up doing there. Sure. So in terms of debt capital markets, let's talk about what are the various types of debt instruments first that form the entire debt universe. So there can be short-term debt and long-term debt. So short-term debt is instruments like commercial paper, working capital facilities. Long-term debt can be bonds or as they are called in India, NCDs, non-convertible debentures. Then there are loans which can be syndicated facilities or they can be bank loans, which could be bilateral in nature. So depending on the requirement of a particular company and depending on their access to a particular market, an appropriate instrument is decided and accordingly the investors who are relevant to that particular market and the investors who are able to regulatorily participate in such instruments those investors are approached and uh, accordingly orders are sought and uh, books are built. One more type of bifurcation in terms of uh, debt instruments is whether the security is publicly listed or if it is private. So there are two so-called debt markets. One is the public markets where debt instruments, just as equity is traded on stock exchanges, similarly, debt instruments are also traded on the markets. So publicly listed bonds, publicly listed NCDs, these are traded on a regular basis and their quotes are also available if you would want to go and look up their rates. On the private side, of course, as I mentioned, for something like a bank loan that a few banks have come together and decided to give a loan to a particular company. This is not something that would typically be listed on, on an exchange. So this is more in the domain of the private debt markets. Where I specifically focus on is US dollar debt that is issued by Indian entities. The typical transaction life cycle that I usually deal with is the first step is, of course, reaching out to the client, pitching to them and uh, presenting a particular idea that may be suited to their needs at that particular time or that may be catching favor with other companies in that domain. So just to gauge their interest, we would try and speak to them to check it, how it aligns with their internal requirements. If the client feels that, yes, this is something that I want to pursue because this would help me meet my objectives in the medium term or in the long term, we are mandated 
onto a transaction. A bank or multiple banks together are man mandated on a transaction, which means that now they have been formally engaged to take that particular transaction to fruition. Before we hit the markets, there are a few steps that need to be undertaken. Number one is due diligence. Because banks that are marketing a particular instrument, they need to be very sure that the information that they are presenting to potential investors is accurate to the best of their knowledge. So they have to conduct due diligence in terms of the financials, the business, the management, and the kind of future projection or the strategy that they have in mind. So that is a very exhaustive process that needs to be taken up by the banks as well as the legal counsels that have been appointed on the transaction. The next step is the documentation. So usually when an issuance is being made in the market, there is an offer document that goes with it. Be it an equity issuance or a debt offering, there is an offering circular that goes with it. It's a very comprehensive document that lists the details of the business, what are the pertinent risks that a particular investor needs to be aware of in order to ensure that they are holistically looking at the company or the instrument and making an appropriate investment decision as per their investment policies. Once the due diligence and the documentation is complete, we hit the markets and try and reach out to investors who have shown interest in similar instruments in the past. And usually depending on the type of instrument, it also dictates the geography or the class of investor that you can reach out to. So for example, in, term, in, in case of dollar bonds, there are two types of in, uh, issuances that can be done. One is the regulation S compliant uh, bonds, which means that the bonds can be only marketed to investors in uh, Europe, Middle East and Asia. Whereas uh, a bond that is compliant with regulation S as well as regulation 144A, is something that can be marketed to investors globally, including investors in the US, unlike a regulation as bond that you cannot market to investors in the US. So once the marketing is complete and investors have gotten comfortable with a particular credit, they put in orders with the syndicate teams of the relevant banks. And these syndicate teams put together an order book, which if an instrument is considered to be in demand, it is typically oversubscribed and depending on the quality of offers and the kind of policies that the issuer has in terms of the investor that they want to engage with, accordingly, the orders are allocated to relevant investors and the issuance is considered to be priced. There is a few days of gap between the pricing and the settlement. A settlement is when the money actually flows into the issuer from the investor's end and depending on the market norms and the regulations, uh, the number of days could vary. So this is the overall transaction life cycle as to what a typical debt capital markets transaction looks like in general. Thank you so much for that overview. How has your experience been working at JP Morgan? You've been there for, I think, close to five, six years now. How's been the experience in working in the debt capital markets and JP Morgan in general? Sure. I've worked across two separate teams in JP Morgan now. And uh, as you said, it's been a fair number of years. The one thing that constantly I saw, whether it was the pre-MBA stint or the internship or the post-MBA stint, it has been that the people here are extremely approachable. And I think that is something that is very important in a small lean team situation, where if you're not able to reach out to somebody who is your senior, but that is the next person who is probably your buddy as well. If you're not able to reach out to them, then it becomes very difficult for you to actually learn the procedures and learn the concepts. Every time that I reached out to somebody in the team, people have set aside time. And when an investment banker sets aside time for somebody who is just trying to learn the ropes and is not actually going to be able to probably help them right away with something, it means a lot. And I have never felt that kind of apprehension when I try to reach out to my seniors, be it somebody as senior as an executive director or a managing director. I have never felt any kind of hesitation, which is fantastic and speaks volumes about the culture that is in place. Of course, things like culture and all are very intangible and probably uh, sound a little bit like fluff to people on the outside uh, till the time you don't actually experience it on your own, but it makes a huge difference. So definitely that is a huge pro of working with JP Morgan. And of course, being one of the big names on the street, there is access to a lot of fantastic transactions and I have been able to learn lots and lots in every new transaction. So 
no two transactions are completely alike it is a new industry it is a new dynamic even the same client if a client is coming to do a bond at two different points of time of course there have been changes to the business there have been changes to their situation so for example a client who probably came during covid obviously was facing different challenges than what they must have been facing pre covid era which is true for each and every company so you get to see different facets of the business and there is a great level of continuity that you are able to see and understand how businesses evolve so that is something that i feel is a huge advantage of working with jp morgan that you have access to the best transactions on the street so yes it's been a great experience overall all right thank you so much shruti i think this was a truly informational session especially for people who are navigating their careers and want to make it big or enter into the investment banking world the viewers who are watching if you need more mentorship or one on one personal coaching just drop in an email to hello at careernub.com and we should be able to pair you up with great mentors like Kriti. And again, thank you so much, Kriti, for spending your time and sharing your experiences with us. So it was a very fun conversation and hopefully it helps people actually break into investment banking. All the very best to whoever is trying. It's not an easy road, but it's worth it.